The year is 1948, and Henry A. Wallace, the former vice president, is standing in front of a large crowd campaigning for the office of the president. But Wallace is no longer running as a Democrat, for he is the 1948 Progressive Party nominee. But why is he running as a third-party candidate? And why didn't he remain Roosevelt's vice president when he ran for a fourth term? But before we discuss the series of events that led up to this, it is important to start at the beginning of the life of America's almost socialist president. In 1888, Henry Agard Wallace was born in Iowa to Henry Cantwell Wallace and Carrie Wallace. Henry Cantwell Wallace, a Republican, served as Secretary of Agriculture nine years before his son eventually would. Since he was a child, Henry A. Wallace had an interest in agriculture and farming and eventually befriended agricultural scientist George Washington Carver. In 1910, Wallace graduated from Iowa State University with a bachelor's degree. He also became an editor for his family's agricultural newspaper, which he worked for from 1910 to 1933. In 1914, Wallace married Ilo Brown, with whom he had two sons and one daughter. In 1926, Wallace co-founded what is now known as the Pioneer Hybrid International, which is now a multi-billion dollar company. Throughout the First World War, Wallace and his father had been aiding the United States Food Administration in its pursuit to increase the production of pigs. After Herbert Hoover, who was serving as the director of the USFA at the time, ditched the plans the Wallaces advocated for to help increase pig production, both of the Wallaces became staunchly opposed to Hoover and his 1920 bid for the presidency. Soon after, Wallace published Agricultural Prices, in which he correctly predicted that the prices of agriculture would drastically decrease in the coming years. To solve this issue, Wallace believed that the government should help regulate the prices of agriculture. Wallace became a major supporter of the McNary Haugen Farm Relief Bill, which eventually passed. In 1928, Wallace supported Al Smith over Herbert Hoover, who he most likely hadn't forgiven for his lack of support as director of the USFA. When the 1932 presidential election rolled around, Wallace became a strong supporter of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who eventually appointed him as Secretary of Agriculture after he won. As Secretary of Agriculture, Wallace championed agricultural reforms and helped pass the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which led to the creation of the Agricultural Adjustment Administration. Unfortunately, in 1936, the Supreme Court decided that the act was unconstitutional and it was struck down. As a response to this, the Soil Conservation and Domestic Allotment Act of 1936 was signed into law shortly after. Wallace later went on to help pass the Bankhead Jones Farm Tenant Act of 1937 and the Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1938. During his time as Secretary of Agriculture, he became a trusted advisor of President Roosevelt and eventually his running mate. Because of his actions and numerous successes as Secretary of Agriculture, Henry A. Wallace is considered to be one of the greatest Secretaries of Agriculture of all time. Wallace was very controversial amongst Democrats for a variety of reasons. Firstly, many of his policies were seen as socialistic in nature, which made him unpopular amongst pro-business Democrats. Secondly, he was very progressive for his time and supported the desegregation of public schools and racial and gender equality. This led him to being unfavorable amongst Southern Democrats, many of whom held bigoted views on issues such as racial and gender equality. Finally, he held very unorthodox religious views and was associated with Russian theosophist Nicholas Royrich. Right-wingers used these views to make Wallace appear mentally unstable. Even though he was eccentric and considered unfavorable by many, President Roosevelt insisted that Wallace be named his running mate. On January 20, 1941, Wallace began his tenure as vice president. He was soon appointed as the chairman of the Supply Priorities and Allocation Board and the Board of Economic Welfare. After the United States entered World War II following the bombing of Pearl Harbor, Wallace as the chairman of the BEW was tasked with obtaining raw materials to support the war effort. As chairman of the BEW, Wallace caused controversy by demanding that the workers who produced the raw materials needed for the war effort would have their standard of living increased. In 1942, Wallace said the following during a speech. The peace must mean a better standard of living for the common man, not merely in the United States and England, but also in India, Russia, China, and Latin America, not merely in the United Nations, but also in Germany, Italy, and Japan. Jesse H. Jones, the Secretary of Commerce and the Chairman of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, disagreed with Wallace due to the amount of money it would take to increase the workers' wages. President Roosevelt responded to this disagreement by taking away the roles of both men. 
Due to the declining health of nearly 63-year-old Roosevelt, it was generally expected that whoever was elected vice president in 1944 would most likely succeed Roosevelt. But in 1944, it was uncertain if Wallace, the most popular candidate for the position amongst the American people, would remain vice president even though Roosevelt wanted him to. Unfortunately, however, the racist, pro-segregation faction of the Democratic Party and the conservative, pro-business faction of the Democratic Party conspired to deny Wallace the vice president nomination in favor of Harry Truman, and they were successful. Wallace became the Secretary of Commerce, and Truman became the Vice President. Roosevelt died soon after, and Truman became President. Even though the nomination for Vice President was stolen from him, Wallace was still an influential member of Truman's cabinet until mid-1946. During his time as Secretary of Commerce, Wallace helped pass the Employment Act of 1946, but some of the more radical parts of the bill, such as full employment, were denied by the Conservatives. He also helped pass the Atomic Energy Act of 1946, which helped supervise the development of nuclear energy. Wallace strongly disagreed with Truman's doctrine of Soviet containment and correctly predicted that this strategy would lead to the disastrous events that became known as the Cold War. He voiced his opinions during a speech in September 1946, during which he said, We should recognize that we have no more business in the political affairs of Eastern Europe than Russia has in the political affairs of Latin America, Western Europe, and the United States. Days later, Truman told Wallace to resign. Wallace responded, with the following. The President of the United States has just requested my resignation as Secretary of Commerce. I therefore am sending to him the following letter. Dear Harry, as you requested, here is my resignation. I shall continue to fight for peace. I am sure that you approve and will join me in that great endeavor. Well, that's that, for the time being, at any rate. Mr. Wallace signs, and his resignation goes into the out tray. After leaving office, Wallace helped start the Progressive Citizens of America, which was a political organization comprised of democratic socialists and social democrats that were committed to ensuring peace with the Soviet Union. Wallace continued to be a strong critic of President Truman, particularly of his antagonistic containment policy and his purge of communist-affiliated government workers. Soon after, Wallace said the following. There is no real fight between a Truman and a Republican. Both stand for a policy which can lead to war in life, our lifetime and make war certain for our children. The American people must have more than a choice between evils. They must have a chance to vote for the greatest good for the greatest number. Only through the organization of a new party in 1948 can the people of the United States voice their true desires and aspirations. To that end, I announce that I will run as an independent candidate in 1948 for President of the United States. Wallace was backed by many intellectuals and celebrities such as Albert Einstein, W.E.B. Du Bois, George McGovern, a young Noam Chomsky, and many others. Wallace eventually chose Glenn H. Taylor, a senator from Idaho, as his running mate. Wallace traveled across both the American North and South campaigning. While in the South, he refused to speak before segregated audiences, and because of this, he was lambasted by a variety of newspapers. Additionally, many of Wallace's supporters were exposed publicly, and many of them lost their jobs. In July of 1948, the Progressive Party was officially created at a national convention in Philadelphia. The Progressive Party takes over in Philadelphia's convention hall, the site of the recent Republican and Democratic conventions. Henry Wallace and his family draw loud cheers from 3,000 delegates. Wallace and Senator Glenn Taylor are unanimously nominated. Satirizing Dewey's acceptance speech, in which Dewey said he made no promises, Wallace says, I tell you frankly, that in obtaining the nomination of the Progressive Party, a nomination which I accept with pride, I have made commitments. I have made them freely. I shall abide by them. 30,000 enthusiasts who paid to get in 
cheer the nominees of the Progressive Party, Henry Wallace of Iowa and Glenn Taylor of Idaho. The party supported the desegregation of public schools, free trade, a national health insurance program, gender equality, the public ownership of large banks, railroads, and power utilities, and making peace with the Soviet Union. Soon after, many associates of Wallace were accused of being communist infiltrators, and this damaged Wallace's reputation seemingly beyond repair. Unfortunately, it seemed that Wallace's third-party candidacy was doomed to fail, as Gallup predicted that Wallace's approval rating had dropped to 5% by 1948. Sadly, when the ballots were finally counted, Henry A. Wallace managed to only get 2.38% of the vote and began to fade into obscurity. Following his defeat in the 1948 election, Wallace became increasingly opposed to the Soviet Union and left the Progressive Party after disagreeing with the party leadership that the United States should stay out of the Korean War. In 1956, Wallace endorsed the Republican Dwight D. Eisenhower for president because he believed that Eisenhower was truly doing his best to make peace between the USA and the USSR. While he did not publicly endorse any candidate in 1960, Wallace supported Lyndon Baines Johnson in 1964. Later that year, Wallace passed away. He was 77 years old. In conclusion, Henry A. Wallace was a fighter who always fought for what he believed in. He was a socialist who represented the working class. He was a New Dealer who rose to prominence as one of the greatest secretaries of agriculture of all time. He was a vice president and was almost the successor of one of the greatest presidents the United States has ever had. Even though he made some significant mistakes such as trusting the Soviets, I believe that the world would have been a much better place if he was our 33rd president instead of just a footnote in history.